Hello and welcome to another Atypical in Philosopher video for another frontline update with myself, Jonathan MSP. This is a frontline update for the Ukraine war and it's the 28th of November 2022. Um, I have caught the dreaded lurgy or something, so my voice isn't uh, great. However, I was asked yesterday, sir, owner of this channel, you are knowledgeable, but can you work on your voice and tone to make it better and softer for public communication? Well, for this, my 487th video for this channel, literally, um, here it is. I've worked on my voice. I hope this is uh, this is better or not. Uh, let's go to the Ukrainian uh, official line on Russian losses for uh, the 28th. This uh, is seen a bit of an uptick again, 590 liquidated men, three tanks, five APCs, two artillery systems, four vehicles, fuel tanks. Again, no drones. What does this tell you? This is the last, since the last cruise missile attack, no drones have been shot down, really, the odd one here and there. Uh, does this show that the Russians are low on those types of equipment and cruise missiles as well? I would say probably. Um it, that would be my guess, but I think that is reflective of something, definitely. Uh, this is a little bit of a worry. In fact, quite a big bit of a worry. So Russia AN-124 transport aircraft began to fly to China very often, often with transponders turned off. This is what we saw with Iran. And we noticed that, that, that exactly this with Iran and they suddenly, Russia started, started suddenly ending up with uh, Shahid drones and possibly... Uh, ballistic missiles going forward and other types of munitions. So if this is happening with China, this is a, this is a huge worry because at the moment, you uh, sorry, Russia have no option of changing the trajectory of this conflict other than to throw more men at the problem. And by throwing more men at the problem, they have this issue of not having the equipment to give to these men. And so they are throwing poorly trained, low morale troops um, with very poor equipment at a problem and hoping to change the course of action. And of course, that's highly unlikely to happen. The only thing that can change the course of action really for the Russians in terms of giving them a chance of, of winning this in the long term is if they suddenly get a, a bunch of equipment that could do that. Now, for the Ukrainians, they are getting you know high-tech, decent equipment um, arguably not enough of it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that is allowing them to have a competitive advantage over the Russians. The Russians are just throwing men at the problem. But now some uh, Chinese believe the planes are being loaded with uniforms, bulletproof vests and other military gear. If this is the case, you know, that could just be the opening of the floodgates as they, as they try, try things out. They kind of prod and probe the Chinese. Oh, can we give them this? Can we give them that? And then eventually this expands into into bigger and better things. I don't know. This could just be well, it is speculation, but this is what this is worrying for me. This is a real uh, problem, I think, for for Ukraine going forward. Be interested to see how how that uh, pans out. Now, uh, there's a lot of talk about first of all winter war, and I'm going to be discussing that in my extra video. Big segment on that. Uh, a lot of talk about the conditions. Uh, it's been really rainy over the last week, and it's looking to get freezing in certain areas over the next week. Mark Hurtling here has talked about trench warfare. So I'm not going to go through this whole thread, but I'll just pick out a few points um, that basically is going to be tough. Essentially, no trench warfare has ever been quickly resolved. Um, and, uh, you, you know, looking through history, it's... Um, it's been it's been tough. In effect, trench is really an extended defensive position with mines, dug in troops, uh, pre-planned artillery and direct fire weapons, open space that doesn't offer cover. It's challenging to attack. A force can choose to go around, over, under or through a dug in enemy. At our US training centers, we train combined arms breach ops. In effect, using everything you have, intelligence, suppression, tanks, precision artillery, infantry, engineers and more. Um, in years commanding and training units, my view is the combined arms breach is the toughest mission imaginable. It requires extensive training, lots of practice, a combination of resources that only advanced armies have, and adaptive and smart leaders. 
To regain the Donbass, Ukraine's army will face a tough fight. They will need precision artillery, great leadership, and ever-increasing combined arms capability. In addition to being a tough fight, it will also take time to trip the Russian forces. They'll succeed, but not fast. I think, going forward, this is going to get really tough. And I'm going to show you a bit of Im imagery from uh, Kherson region. To sh and I've already shown you stuff over the last week about Russians digging huge trenches, putting a bunch of dragon's teeth in. But you've got to remember that, that it's even worse than that. And I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, here, Hurtling talks about um, Kherson. Uh, let's turn to the southeast. The fight will require a different approach using conventional forces with good intel, solid maneuver and firepower precision targeting, as well as help from territorials and resistance. And it will require crossing the Dnipro. So he's saying down in the Kherson region, it's not just that you have to overcome these defenses, but you've also got to get across quite a large river uh, with a large amount of forces. There are no bridges intact. Uh, it, this is really tough. Um, so things are not going to be easy for the Ukrainians going forward. Um, if attacking a trench line with a breach is the hardest mission, uh, an opposed river crossing and the continuation of assault is a close second. This is what, but then of course, once you get across the river, you've then got dug in defenses, as I'm just about to show you. This is what a large part of the U UA will have to do to continue the attack east towards Melitopol and beyond. Ukraine has been masterful thus far in attacking and defeating Russian forces that have occupied their sovereign land occupied their sovereign land. As I said last week, phase four of this fight will be tough. I've outlined the reasons why. I remain convinced Ukraine will succeed with NATO and US support. I actually think it is possibly even tougher than than he thinks. So these are some images from Kherson, right? Here you've got some trench lines being dug uh, and these other trenches behind with revetments, which basically allow you to entrench vehicles. So self-propelled gun, guns, howitzers, tanks, whatever, to fire over. But you've got to also remember that the Russians will be heavily, heavily mining area. So not only will you have probably three separate lines of these entrenchments, uh, probably going in, you know, increased size as you go back, and you'll have maybe mobilized troops in this front line, you know, your cannon fodder, and then increasingly better troops as you go back. So the, and, but you have just lines and lines of mines. So approaching these is really, really difficult. Uh, and, you know, you've seen films and footage and learned about First World War. That's beginning to look a lot like the First World War. Um, your options are trying to get around the side of these things. Are they putting these things right down the length and breadth of of their defensive lines? Or are there, you know, gaps in these that can be uh, taken advantage of? Are they trying to protect pre predominantly roads from attack? Uh, as the ISW says, that actually there, if, if you can attack across open country, then you do have a chance of getting around some of these um defenses and then flanking them and that could be a problem for the russians here's a uh a zoomed in picture of these entrenchments here uh you have these kind of they're not quite zigzag uh, and that could be a problem for the russians because imagine you could just lay some kind of i don't know bombing run down here then you could take out anything down these trenches if it's all in a straight line. That's why you know, prefer to have zigzags. However, you know, trying to get stuff overhead here could be difficult. This is satellite imagery, which is obviously in out in in space, so it's it's easy to, easier to get these pictures and through drones, which will be you know, which will struggle to get over this area with the amount of electronic warfare that's likely to be. Um, around here and other kind of air defense systems. But you've got the dragon's teeth and you've got lines of trenches in front of that. Um, here's some other images. Uh, obviously, defending this crossroads is seen as important with zigzag trenches now, uh, straighter trenches in front of that. Um, did, you know, there will be rationale behind these, I'm sure. Um, but, but the point is that, you know, these are going to be difficult positions to overcome. You've got a bunch of equipment dug in here. I mean, the cloud cover is making that difficult to see, but all of these are where you, you've got artillery placements or SBGs, you know, other forms of artillery or tanks being able to rain down on people attacking, uh, as well as heavily mined fields, uh, 
machine gun positions, mortars, all of this just becomes um, a bit of a nightmare for the attacking force to overcome. And this is just in Kherson. You see, you see this all up and down. So at the moment, when if we go back to our war map, map, and I showed you this yesterday on one of my videos, is that there now uh, there's now evidence of defense those kind of defenses right the way from the northern border here, coming all the way down behind Svatova, uh, the Kremlin, and then you've got the Wagner line coming up here at the moment, and then down in front of these uh, towns. And then following this border, the other side of the river, all the way uh, to back to the Russian border in this kind of annexed uh, Luhansk area. Uh, and one is imagining that you're you're having you know dug in positions all the way down here, especially since this has been fought over since 2014, uh, and now we're seeing it in Kherson uh, to to a great extent and behind probably you know several layers of those going back, and then even being dug in in Crimea. The point is that Russia are so defensively minded now, and you think, oh, you can criticise them for that, thinking, oh, what are your intentions? You're not trying to liberate anything anymore. But the point is that, actually, Ukraine are really going to struggle to liberate a lot of these territories. And if they do, it will require a massive amount of attrition. And if it's not a massive amount of attrition, it's a huge amount of um, precision strikes and ordnance and combined arms activity, which means they're really going to need to get air superiority to be able to do something. And that's that's somewhat unlikely. So this is going to be really, really difficult. It's not good news for the Ukrainians. I don't think this, you know, people might laugh at the dragon's teeth and whatnot, but this is, it's going to be tough. Um, Sorry, a bit of music there for you. I hate that when you when you press it, it brings the sound back on. Uh, this is just an example of the conditions. This is five days old now. I don't know exactly where this is. Some people have said it's around Pavlivka, um, but it's somewhere in the in the Donbass, uh, according to others. You know, uh, the point is this is uh, well, this is actually a Russian tank that's got stuck and it's been pulled out by Ukrainians. Here, it's been pulled out, but this is. The kind of conditions that um, that both sides are up against, and that is made or makes these defensive scenarios all the more challenging. I suppose it makes it difficult to dig around there and to live in those trenches, but that, to overcome those trenches and to move, not only are you uh, trying to deal with mines, but you're dealing with ground that is incredibly slow to travel over. And then we have possibly freezing temperatures to freeze that over makes it easier to get over but makes the conditions to live in ha have their own challenges okay uh let's start moving towards the front lines first of all uh places have been hit up and down the front line here we've got a uh, claim that Svatova somewhere was hit with 70 enemy servicemen were there don't know how many were wounded or dead um and that's an enemy object in the in the area of Svatova. um and as we move up to the front line, let me find that on the map for you. So we are going to move to the uh, Kupiansk Svatova Kremlin line. So I was just saying that some, somewhere was hit overnight in Svatova or, or the end of yesterday. We're looking at Kupiansk down to Svatova and Kremlin. Um, and quite a bit to be concerned about possibly up in this area. Um, it is not easy, and it's not easy around Kuzmivka. Uh, this is this uh, town or village I've been talking about for some time now. Uh, as we come down from Kupiansk to Svatova, we have Kuzmivka here. Okay, so uh, in Kuzmivka, and let's get all our roads shown here. There's been talk about Novoselivska to the west being um, attacked by the Russians. And then the Ukrainians are apparently have been pushing back. I've got that as contested. Um, if you look at the topographical map of the area, here we have, uh, you'll see as I press on it to move it, the uh, forested areas or wooded areas get um, shown more clearly. They're the gray areas there. So there's a wooded area to the north of Novotolivska and Kuzmivka. Uh, and this is on high ground in Novoselivska and the um, the wooded area is on high ground. But Kuzmivka is in in the lower ground. It's kind of a, a bit of a tributary valley, if you like. 
So with the amount of wet weather we've been having, Kuzumivka is going to be fairly difficult going there. So to the north, we have this wooded area. Now this, I've got it as a grey area. There's been some talk over the recent days that Russia took this wooded area and then the Ukrainians are pushing back, but the Russians have heavily mined it. Reporting from Korea, um, Ukraine has done a video on this. Uh, and, and the Ukrainians are trying to get that back because that's that could be very important for eventually encircling Kuzumivka. But also there's um, Kolomir Ichika down here, which is contested as well, and a lot of fight going on around that. So again, often we talk about trying to take an objective is more about encircling it, uh, but encircling can often be difficult. So there's lots of key activity going on in, in this forest and south of Kuzumivka, but it is about Kuzumivka and it's tough going for the Ukrainians around here, but you're starting to see uh, some counterattacks at the moment. I still have this basically as a big gray area um, and I'll keep it there until I, I get sort of solid evidence either way. But it's not easy for uh, the Ukrainians there. And that can pretty much be said up and down this whole front line. Not a lot of information's come out. Um, you know, Ploschchanka is still a scene of, of heavy fighting. And then we get down to around Kremina. Apparently, uh, there is a lot of light, uh, fighting to the west of Kremina. Russians are pushing to the west of Kremina. Um, but the usual sort of claims about being repelled and all that no no fine finer detail coming out unfortunately i've kept the brova broadly in well it's on the edge of ukrainian territory a bit of gray a bit of a gray zone there are there are there's a lack of claim as to exactly what's going on in dubrovka and who holds it um so it might not be uh, ukrainian and controlled it could be be more of a gray zone and then as we uh, look into this forest there's uh, a lot of fight over over control for this forest going towards Kremina um, and, and down to Belarivka which is apparently you know or, as I said yesterday all the all the houses there are in a little bit of trouble it's um, yeah not looking good in Belarivka let's do a tiny bit of live edit editing because that attack uh, whenever it was was pretty much repelled I think uh Let's call Bilirivka a bit of a grey area around here. Grey zone, I should say. Um, although, you know, a deep state map has Bilirivka under Ukrainian control still. Um, but I think it's safe to assume that pretty much all the way down here is a grey zone between these two lines, as you'd expect between two lines. They don't, uh, it's not It's not exact science. And as soon as you walk over a line, suddenly you're walking into uh, the control of, of your enemy. Um, it, there are pushes and pulls and there's a whole kind of grey zone, no man's land type thing between uh, between the two sides. So as we come all the way down to Bakhmut, there is a fair bit to say about Bakhmut and there has been some change in territory. So as we look at uh, Bakhmut, uh, a couple of points are of importance. This uh, petrol station, this gas station to the north uh, northeast of Bakhmut, as well as all of these southern towns down here. So let's look up here. Well, apparently there's sort of heavy activity around this. I showed you some thermal imaging of attacks on this gas station uh, with an accumulation of Russian troops. Um, let's see what some of the sources say. <clears throat> Russian sources, this is no reports, claim that Russia captured uh, Ozaryanivka and pushed further to Kurdi. Umivka. We couldn't verify this claim yet, waiting for info. There's quite a bit of info coming out, really, that that, that is the case. Uh, Russian forces attacked Bakhmut from the north near the Alpha gas station. Just like 24th of November, they got roasted and retreated. So they're, on on the one hand, at least according to no reports, the Russians attacked here and got, uh, got repelled quite successfully. But on the other hand, there is a lot going on down south here. So not much coming out of Opitnye and Ivan Khrad, although I imagine there, there's still heavy fighting there. Uh, but it's it's down towards Klischivka. Apparently, there's the, the Russians are making gains towards Klischivka. And they have taken uh, Ozaryanivka and actually Zelonopilia, uh, which is just to the sort of northeast of Kodiyomivka 
and this is the uh, settlement there where there's a lot of heavy fighting. But the Russians do apparently have control over these two settlements next to Kodiumivka. So this looks bad for the Ukrainians at the moment because the this gradual encroachment into the Ukrainian uh, lands to the south of Bakhmut enables the Russians to continue their attempts to encircle Bakhmut rather than taking it head on. Although they appear to be doing all of the all of the above, t trying to take it down south, trying to take it up north, Solodar and Bakhmutska, um, and by this gas station here, uh, as well as taking it uh, around, you know, in in the outskirts and the suburbs, uh, as well as obviously opinion Ivan Krad. So the question is, do, is this the kind of push and pull of this conflict that we've seen, you know, little settlements go one way and then go the other way? Or is this actually a bit of a tidal change in terms of what the PMC, the Wagner mercenaries, uh, are able to do? And they are gaining in areas with the, that are unlikely to be regained um, and that give them uh, some kind of a tactical advantage in taking Bakhmut. I guess we will see over the next few days. My impressions are this isn't good news for the Ukrainians and that Bakhmut is a terrible place in terms of uh, some of the footage coming out of the trench, the trenches around Bakhmut with the, with the water and the mud is absolutely terrible. Really, really difficult conditions around here. But it does look like uh, Wagner and the Russians are beginning to get some advantage, certainly to the south of Bakhmut. Bakhmut is very heavily uh, defended inside the, the, the town itself. Um, but uh, this is, I would say, slightly worrying. As we come down south to Avdivka, not a lot of news out of here. Just uh, similar as it's always been. Well, not always, but similar as it's been for the last sort of few weeks. Um, attacks around Pervomaisky, Vodjanyi, uh, Opitnyi, and north of Avdivka. Uh, not too much news other than that. Uh, repelled attacks. A few bits of so a few bits of footage to show you to support uh, how tough it is around Avdivka. I've cut out the bit where you see Ukrainian dead soldiers. This is a Russian uh, bit of footage around some uh, trench lines near Avdivka. And what's interesting is it, this all looks like a complete mess, but that's almost certainly because of artillery just throwing uh, stuff all over the shop. Um, but these are the tiny little trenches uh, that, you know, people have had to live in and then just all the equipment thrown everywhere, rubbish and everything, uh, trees absolutely destroyed as, as this place would have come under repeated artillery attack. And the whole place just looks absolutely apocalyptic. So Avdivka is not, um, yeah, a pleasant place to be and, and the areas around there. But there is uh, constant pressure on the Ukrainians there. And indeed, uh, the BBC have just done a report from Avdivka itself, from the actual sort of uh, the town itself that is getting shelling. I won't, I won't play it. I won't play it all to you, but uh, or won't play it other than to show you a little bit of the initial stuff. Uh, the reporter goes on to say that uh, and interview people who are still living there. He say that most people are not not there anymore, and the ones who are are exclusively kind of living in basements, uh, using nineteen forties wood stoves to heat themselves and, it, and generators and whatnot. And it, it's just yeah, it's a bit of a ghost town. Um, but it does it does take shelling day you know every day and every night. Uh, it's just really really tough as you can expect, right? As you'd expect. Okay, uh, the, not a lot of um, very explicit information coming out of there. Uh, as we move on down to Marinka, so Marinka has had a lot of pressure from the uh, from the Russians. The battle for Marinka is getting serious and a bit troubling for the Ukrainians. Russia managed to grab a foothold in the eastern outskirts and is approaching the city center. I, I would say this is possibly a bit out of date. They are in the city center and they're fighting very hard over it. Uh, the Ukrainians reportedly pulled up reserves to reinforce the area. Um, so that is uh, that's what's happening there. No different from what I've been saying over the last few days. No more information coming out of there other than it is uh, tough fighting around there. 
And then we get down to uh, the Nova Merkalivka and uh, Vukhladar area, so Vukhladar Pavlivka. So no report says that the uh, Ukrainians attacked uh, Donetsk Center and Kiev. Uh, Kievsky district a couple of times today, unclear what the targets were hit. So this is going back to Donetsk, the actual city. Uh, just to remind you, we are now uh, down here on this sort of uh, corner of the front line, having just passed Avdivka and Donetsk. So Donetsk is shelled uh, routinely by the Ukrainians, and it's under a lot of pressure. At least not, it, they are trying to, one assumes, take out... Um, very particular targets within Donetsk. It's not just a, like a citywide bombing, although the Russians might tell you otherwise. But that is that is something that's happening daily. Um, uh, Noel then goes on to say, Russian forces are not on the offensive anymore near Pavlivka. It's mostly artillery duels with Vukhladar as target for Russia. Now, this is where I have to say, I don't know why Russia haven't been doing this for the last month, which is don't send any troops into Vukhladar and just absolutely hammer it with everything you've got from a distance. I, you know, again, it's not the first time I said this, which is, you know, you've got the artillery, just absolutely, but you, this is what they've been doing everywhere everywhere else, which is flatten it and then go in. So I don't know why Vukhladar became a different thing for them, where they didn't flatten it and they tried to go in via Pavlivka and then the Russians just got hammered. So the, like I said yesterday, it, it appears that the Ukrainians aren't in Pavlika, but they, Pavlivka, but they have fire control over the north of the settlement. And so therefore, as soon as the Russians go into that area, they just get hammered. Uh, and in fact, they just get hammered in Pavlika generally or have done. Why don't the Russians just t completely flatten Vukhladar and then move on? Uh, and they're doing elements of that, but then attacking Pavlik Pavlivka again and again. Uh, so here's a thread on pretty much talking about stuff to do with this. So after failure uh, to take full control of Pav Pavlivka, the enemy has been building up a striking force near Vukhladar for the past few weeks. It's unclear whether the enemy is going to start this week or is waiting for more favorable conditions. This is an example of how Russians are using a helicopter in the Vukhladar area. Such a relatively close direct fire indicates the insufficient air defense capabilities which Russians are exploiting. So there needs to be better air defense around, but it's quite difficult uh, getting that in there without it being hit. Uh, on the Ukrainians need the air defense aids. They didn't do any harm, but let them uh, celebrate. They have been using a combination of artillery, tanks, helicopters, and MLRS to target observation posts and fortified positions, hoping to soften up defenses in the Vukhladar area. They are likely preparing for another doomed offensive operation. Despite having firepower advantages in almost every aspect, their artillery tank and helicopter crews continue to lie about successful target destructions. As a result, we will likely see another fruitless meat grinder like in Pavlivka. So th this is, and this is referring to what, what happened back in Pavlovka, and the idea of, uh, I've talked about it before, which is Vranyo, which is the idea that up the chain of command, you just inflate and lie, and but then that's almost expected by the person above you. But then eventually people at the top of the command structure make decisions based on un uninformed, uh, or based on poor information, uh, such as let's attack Vukhladar head on from Pavlovka because we weakened them sufficiently. Oh no, we haven't weakened them sufficiently. They're hammering us. So let's start again. Uh, and, and this cycle goes on. Um, uh, but uh, it's, yeah, it just beggars belief that they have continued to try and attack Pavlovka rather than just flatten it. Uh, but there you go. That's the Russians for you. Okay, as we come down to Kherson, Let's have a look at what we have here. So there, this is the Inhulets River going through the Kherson region to the right bank of the uh, Dnipro River. There, the Ukrainians have been successfully building pontoon bridges to um, allow traffic to cross the Inhulets again and allow their forces to get across as well. So that's all good news on that front. No map changes. Russia shell Kherson, especially Korobelnyi, Island, also Chernobyvka, that's the that's the airport just north of Kherson, was heavily targeted. This is uh, basically talking about Kherson getting hit with a lot of um, artillery, but also the uh, Ukrainians are hitting places like Oleshki um, here and, and other places, targets within this whole area to try and soften it, one assumes, for uh, some kind of advance at some point. But as I talked to you about at the beginning of this, Peace, 
uh, the defences are being really heavily built up in the Kherson area. Um, so that is uh, something to look out for. Uh, as we move on, the military operation on the Kimban Spit of the Mikhailiv region continues. Natalia Humanyuk, uh, head of the Joint Coordination Press Center of the Defense Forces of Southern Ukraine, says the same thing is happening there that is happening all over Ukraine. War. Uh, so we we keep hearing these rumors and the Ukraine Ukrainians do keep saying, yes, there is stuff happening on the Spit. How far these troops have gone and what type of troops these are and whether they are just special forces is is basically a complete unknown at the moment. Uh, some people are denying things are really happening here and saying it's all just smoke and mirrors. Uh, but the Ukrainians are saying that things are happening there. I'd imagine they are, uh, but it's just not the lightning quick, um, you know, offensive that some pro-Ukrainians would be wanting. Other than that, continued attacks, you know, rocket attacks from uh, high Mars and what have you, all, all behind this area. There's also the advantage to this area and this includes Zaporizhia compared to much of the Donbass is partisan activity so you have a lot more activity that's going on behind here particularly the major um, cities if you like like Melitopol or Mariupol where the partisans are causing a problem for the administrations there that isn't particularly happening in the Donbass region because you have such a, a greater amount of pro-Russian sentiment here all the pro-Ukrainians moved out pretty much from 2014 onwards. Uh, and this is what I've been talking about, about the difficulties in, in liberating this area is that actually many of the people remaining here at the moment uh, are going to be somewhat pro-Russian compared to uh, being, compared to, you know, these other areas that have only recently been occupied by the Russians. Anyway, there you go. Thank you for that. Please check out my extra video yesterday on my other channel, ATP Geopolitics, youtube.com forward slash ATP Geo. Um, and please like and subscribe to that channel. Uh, and thank you for supporting me here. Please like, subscribe and share. And there are all the many ways that you can help me down in the description below. Anyway, toodle pips and I'll catch you later for an extra video.